for joining us in today's webinar. My name is Iga Kurowska and I, feel I will have a pleasure to moderate today's session. As you can see on the screen, we will be speaking about what should legal professionals know about artificial intelligence and how should it be taught. So it's a very actual topic. It's something that we speak of um, a lot with the modernization of the legal prof of the legal profession of the legal services and also with ILSA of the legal uh, education. So first of all, let me introduce you to our alliance. We realized together with other law professionals that the legal education needs modernization and technology should allow for that modernization to happen. So we got together with a group of specialists from across the sectors of the legal profession, such as law teachers, um, legal tech, uh, also startup founders and other members of this legal field. And we invited the universities to exchange their practices, uh, to tell us what they do, to show our, our programs, and we invited them to the debate. And today's session is one of the occasions for everyone to interact, to get to know each other. And we also invited special guests. If I may just ask um, the participants to turn off the uh, mics, because there are some technical interruptions. Uh, so together we are discussing today the role of the inter artificial intelligence, which is a buzz, buzz world, and we will, our speakers will present us how it should be taught to the legal profession professionals. What we do at ILSA is that, as said, we promote the engagement and the collaboration. So far, we have gathered more than 15 universities from all over the world. We also promote the exchange of good practices on innovation, because let's not forget that legal technology is just a part of the legal innovation and it's not a solution to all the problems that the legal professionals are dealing with. Also, we organize events such as the one of today. Um, in the future, maybe we will have a chance to meet each other face to face. Also, we help the members to promote their innovative practices through the, um, the common listing of the universities that are, parts of, that are part of ILSA and promote what they do broadly in the social media, for instance, and in the press. We also create a community because we believe that collective intelligence is the way to progress in that very vivid topic. And also we will try to lobby for the programs, official programs at the law universities to advance. So let's get to today's event. And it is my pleasure to welcome to today's speakers. Um, it's going to go in the following way. First of all, after my introduction, which is uh, finishing shortly, um, the speakers, the floor will be given to the speakers. And after that, as mentioned, all the participants will be welcome to interact and ask their questions. So the questions of today are, why should artificial intelligence interest lawyers and law students? What should be taught to law students about artificial intelligence? And does your organization offer any artificial intelligence related courses to lawyers or law students? So it is my pleasure again to welcome among us Gabriel Ser Lopez Serrano, who is the attorney at law and government affairs director of Microsoft. Our second guest, and not such a guest, because she's the president of ILSA, of International of uh, Innovation in Law Studies Alliance, is Maria Jesus Gonzalez Espejo. She's also a founder of Instituto de Innovación Legal, and Bashak Ozan Osparlak, who's the attorney at law and law lecturer at Ozin University. So please, the first will go in the order of the presented speakers. Gabriel, the floor is yours. Thank you, Iga. I will upload my, my presentation now. So please let me know when, when, when you're 
you can see it. Can, can you see it? Yes, it's working great. All right, good. Well, first, hi, greetings from uh, Madrid, Spain. And thanks to the Innovation in Law Studies Alliance and my co-panelists for their kind invitation to this, to this panel. Let me start first by sharing with you which were my drivers when I chose to become a lawyer. Before attending law school, I was between becoming an IT engineer or a lawyer. I chose to become a lawyer because I always thought that it was an exciting path that could get me closer to technology, and most importantly, because I believe I could work towards unlocking opportunities and better access for justice to all. I have been very fortunate to have dedicated most of my professional career in the field of technology. I have experienced firsthand how societies can thrive when the right policies are implemented to democratize the access to technology. I have also seen the need for the legal profession to contribute towards the understanding, the development and the limitation of technology, such as artificial intelligence or AI. Now, AI is a technology that has been around us for, so, for many decades. Throughout all those years, it has received both positive and negative feedback, and both for good reasons. Many enthusiasts have reflected about how and when a general artificial intelligence will come and dominate humans. Some others, when it, uh, when it will come to solve all humanity problems. The reality check for this technology came, in my opinion, at the end of 2019, beginning of 2020, the COVID era. Before this moment, there was such much faith deposited on artificial intelligence that many persons thought that this technology could solve any relevant problem of humanity just by the click of a button. The pandemic has taught us in many, many hard lessons. I want to highlight two very important learnings, at least for me. The first one is humility. Now we know that AI will not solve all humanity problems. And the second one is that there is a clear threat of a digital divide for the future of the overall society between those who have access to technology and those who have not. Let me start first with the risk of digital divide. AI is a technology that requires several underlying technologies. For the sake of simplicity, I will reduce it to the following ones. Cloud computing, algorithms, connectivity, and data. Mountains of data. Currently, there are clear there are two clear poles in the world that are concentrating most of the development and investment on AI technologies. This is the US and China. About 100 companies collect more than 50% of all the data generated online. This concentration has an impact on geopolitical power and economic wealth. We just recently seen how much the, the democratic and the, uh, the democracies all across the globe are being impacted by the abuse of this, uh, by this power. So the question is how we can create opportunities in other parts of the world to thrive in the digital economy. I believe it, it starts with empowering people with access to technology. How? Let's begin with education by developing the skills needed for the digital economy, which in our profession spans not only from learning AI tools that are available for the legal profession, but as well to the understanding on how this technology is impacting fields like criminal, civil, commercial, environmental, or corporate law. Even for those interests in economy and politics, there are also a handful of fields to be explored. 
including areas like lawful access to digital evidence, international uh, transference, misinformation, cybersecurity, etc. In other words, there are loads to learn and contribute in this field. But most importantly, there is an opportunity for everybody to develop and thrive in this new era. Okay, you might, you might be thinking that I'm going a little bit over the top here about AI. However, I also believe that this technology mo must be harnessed responsibly. This is one of the most important areas where we as lawyers can contribute in the development of AI. And that is the responsible use of artificial intelligence. There are many decisions that are simply just too important for machines to make them. We need humans in the most important decisions that can have an impact on our fundamental rights. Because there are many examples around the world about how an improper use of this technology can result in inequalities, unjust discrimination, and harm to our communities. That is why we need a principal approach to the, the use of this technology. There are many governments, institutions, and companies that believe that the use of this technology does not mean that we have to disregard our timeless values. These timeless values include the need of transparency, accountability, privacy, security, safety, diversity, and fairness. So even if it is only to learn how to change the filters during your video conference in a trial, it is paramount for our profession moving forward to equip us with the tools needed to contribute to continue contributing to the society. We need new skills for a new reality. This is a very exciting and rewarding profession. And AI is a fantastic tool that we can all use for the common good. Thank you. Gracias. Gracias, Gabriel. Thank you very much for your presentation. And now I see and understand why you were happy about me mentioning the cats. Uh, indeed, today's webinar seems um, maybe a bit over the top when it comes to the reality of sometimes lawyer not, lawyers not being able to handle the simplest technology. But of course, uh, it brings a lot of joy and um, and fun to our profession as well. So thanks a lot. I will just address quickly one question that was asked on the chat before I give the floor to Maria Jesus. Of course, our webinar is recorded and will be published on ILSA website. You can all, uh, already access the videos of the previous webinars that we had, as well as the infographics that we have prepared that resume uh, that summarize the main points of our debates. Uh, so the floor uh, goes to Maria Jesus, who one more time is the president of Innovation in Law Studies Al Alliance, as well as the founder of Instituto de Innovación Legal. We cannot hear you, Chesa. Yes, I know, I know, I know. So thank you, Iga. Thank you, Gabriel. Let me first share my screen. And um, I share with you my presentation. Okay, there we are. Can you see? Yes. Okay, great. Um, let me put it now. You can probably see it better, no? In the uh, full way, no? Not yet, but it's but coming. I'm, yeah, it's good. It's better. Okay. Okay, so why this title? Well, this title comes from, from my own needs. Um, I was invited to uh, teach already in three different programs, uh, artificial intelligence, and I really struggle to, um, to, to, um, to find a way to do it because it is not simple. And a lot of what I'm going to share here comes from my own experience and is uh, let's, let's take it as a proposal to be improved by, by all of us. 
So I just want to put here the seed for a discussion that maybe we could have in the coming future, because in ILSA, uh, what we are noticing is that these webinars are the beginning of the discussion, but not the end. Like uh, some days ago, we had another webinar uh, and, 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 and a lot of people wanted uh, us to discuss about syllabus and how should the syllabus on legal tech be. So we probably set up working groups in the coming future, and this could be the second uh, working group. So let's go for it. Um, what do we need to learn about AI? Uh, well, uh, I think that we can classify in three main group of reasons why. First of all, of all I think that we, uh, as, as legal um, skilled people, uh, we understand the system. And um, I always say we should be, let's say, more responsible citizens. We should become activists, of, of uh, civil activists. Because AI, as we all know, is impacting tax systems, is, is impacting human and consumer rights, is impacting the labor market, and so on and so on. Therefore, we as citizens should be, let's say, aware and active. The second reason why we should uh, understand AI is because there is, a, let's say, a, a need of advice. Uh, there, there are necessary legal professionals who can really provide services related to AI. There are people developing AI, there are people using AI, and uh, there are people who just want to know if their rights are being violated at a certain moment uh, because of the use of AI. Therefore, there is clearly a source of potential income for uh, legal professionals. The third reason is that we, as legal professionals, we should understand that we have to be tech competent. This means that if technology is there, we are obliged to understand what the offer is and which of this offer uh, should be we be handling, buying, using, etc. Therefore, uh, to understand uh, AI as a tool for our jobs to do them more efficiently, I think is also something that justifies why we should know about AI. So here I have uh, written in a more detailed way uh, why uh, AI is impacting us as professionals. First of all, legal framework. So there is there is an, a legal framework. Okay, now it's still not so developed, but it's, it's being developed. And, and in fact, we also have, as I will say later, opportunities to work as advisors. Why not? Second, AI tools for legal, um, AI legal tech, we could call it. Third thing is that there already, Gabriel has shown you um, one uh, slide with some cases. And there are already cases in Italy, in Spain, in Holland. Um, I have a classification and there are already enough to uh, really teach nice things on uh, the judicial approach to uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, additionally, AI is being used and developed by businesses, bank, insurance companies, hospitals are using it and sometimes not in the right way, sometimes there are legal issues around it. And of course, there is always a legal issue when AI is being developed, because as we all know, there are privacy um, questions uh, involved, uh, there are um, IP questions involved, there are competition law involved, etc. Uh, additionally, uh, AI is impacting the legal profession and the legal system as a whole, and as I already said, it's impacting us as individuals. So here, what I have done is uh, made again the list of, of things where AI is impacting and then write down the kind of services or the kind of reasons why we should be learning and understanding AI very well. So, well, we have a, the chance to become advisor to legislators. We have the chance or we should be understanding which tools there are and for what they are. We should understand as well um, how AI is helping conflict resolution, which is already helping, then IP, competition, consumer law, data protection and compliance, as well as a strategy, market research, legal marketing, people's management. Indeed, AI can be very, very useful to manage in a proper way, in a better way, legal organizations. And finally, as I already said, civil activism. So, um, okay, now we know that we have to learn about it because there are a lot of reasons that justify our need to learn about it. 
And how can we learn about it? Okay, well, of, as always, we can do a degree on AI, we can do a minor, we could do a master's, we could do workshops, or maybe other kind of options. Um, there are already um, several things. If somebody's interested, I could mention who is doing what, but I cannot do, enter now because I don't have much time. And here it comes my very, uh, let's say, um, um, how would I say, um, ambitious proposal. Uh, I've been thinking how to teach AI in a proper way, and I have created this framework with six levels, um, which I think are the basic levels, but they really uh, help a lawyer to understand uh, and be able to tackle all the needs I have been mentioning before, uh, before in my presentation. So the first one is what is AI? Because everybody talks about it, but they uh, what I hear very often is that they mix concepts like uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, expert systems, uh, general AI. And I think that we need to understand what is it, what is not, and and, uh, and what uh, what is uh, what are the most relevant ones, the ones that are already here, and the ones that maybe one day are here and would of course impact um, humanity in an incredible way. Secondly, AI and the legal system, of course, uh, the ethical framework that was Gabriel mentioning right now, which is amazing. I mean, there is a, an incredible field of research already with over a hundred ethical codes um, edited or let's say created by the different companies that are uh, using AI. Legal take based on AI, so the tools, then AI by design, because uh, as I said, we uh, have to be uh, ready to help those who are developing AI. And then finally, AI-based AI uh, legal tech. So this framework, um, I'm willing to, uh, let's say in this workshop, share it with uh, the ones who want to join us. And we can, of course, improve it and ensure that uh, many other topics may come and we may, uh, may end up with a 10-level training, but um, this is the beginning of something. So uh, there it is. Um, then my my how, so how would I do it? Okay, in my case, I think that AI deserves already a 100% devoted course. So I wouldn't mix it with legal tech, blockchain, smart contracts, and all the other stuff because it's a lot. And this is really a complex field and it really devotes its own, let's say, uh, concentration. Secondly, I think it's a, it's a uh, let's say, um, a knowledge that uh, demands certain maturity. So I would say let's do it later, not not in the degree, but I would say that it's more a postgraduate level. This can be discussed as well, and we can discuss this in the Q&A. Then I think it has to be a mixture between legal, social, activism, and tech. So we have to uh, approach uh, AI from all the different aspects and not be like, okay, let's do this course on the legal framework, or let's do this course on ethics or let's do this course completely practical and, and let's just use tools. And I think it should be a mirror. And finally, I think it should be a mixture between theory and practice. So these are my, let's say, the, the features of the course I would suggest. And here, just for those who don't know much about this and want to jump into AI and, and start understanding what is this all about, I'm going to give you um, a couple of ideas. So please watch this film. Is an imitation game in English. In Spanish, it has a name which has nothing, nothing to do because they like translating uh, things in a very innovative way. I can't remember the name, but I can look for it. Uh, second, uh, just use one of the several platforms that can allow you to create chatbots like this one, Bot Libre, but there are many other. Then this Mimo stuff is an app and you can get addicted to it. So please don't blame me once you're addicted because it's not my fault, it's your own fault. But it is so well defined. And this, I think it shows not only how you can uh, teach something which is, I think, not so uh, simple to uh, simple people like me uh, regarding coding, but also do it in a very fun way and in a very, uh, let's say, um, uh, engaging uh, way. And finally, uh, I suggest you to read uh, the book I edited. I'm sorry for my uh, advertising my own book. And like Francisco Umbral, the journalist, Spanish journalist, who made a joke about um, advertising its own book. OK, but I think it's a book which will let you uh, understand very well all these facets I have been talking about. The book is called An Introductory Guide to Artificial Intelligence for Legal Professionals. We are uh, nine or ten authors in the book, and I hardly uh, invite you to read it. So, OK, this is my um, last slide. 
Um, I'm confident that at this point I have demonstrated you that AI, that AI uh, um, is something for lawyers and we need to learn about it. Um, doing so uh, means multiple things. So this is not a simple thing. It's not okay. Let's you know create a course tomorrow and start doing it. No, no, we have to think about it because there are many facets uh, involved here. So let's think about them, but they're already there. Like, as I said, uh, human rights violations are giving us a lot of information of what we need to do. Then secondly, the legal framework and the uh, ethics, e ethical framework, then the technology itself. And then uh, finally, how can we use it in, in, in legal organizations? So, OK, let's 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 think about it. I think we we uh, in universities, bar associations and all kind of legal organizations should start developing these kind of programs. And my six level training approach is just uh, the beginning of something. And later in the Q&A, we can discuss about it. Thank you so much. And I really hope I respected my time. Thank you, Iga. I stopped sharing my screen. Iga, your, your mic, your microphone. Yes. Um, so thanks a lot, Chusa, for uh, this presentation. It was really interesting to see such a pragmatic approach to teaching inter uh, artificial intelligence. So now I give the floor to our last speaker before we jump into the debate. Please, everyone, listen to Bashak. Thank you, Iga. Thank you, Maria. And thank you, Ilsa family, for organizing this webinar. And thank you, Gabriel and Maria, for speaking. Um, I'm going to start immediately. My first answer for the first question that AI must interest lawyers may be for the same reason it interests artists. Let's think about the times before cameras become widespread. At that time, ambassadors used to travel with painters with a long time. But that painters not only made pictures about paintings about the diplomatic meetings, but also the cities they visited so that we can see what Istanbul, for example, looks like hundreds of years ago, thanks to the Farvai. But after photo camera became widespread, not only painting what you see as an artist, but adding your emotions and other techniques, mixturing techniques became important. And Devry Marble looked at Istanbul and made something else at Istanbul Red. And now data as a new artist tool also, Rafik Anadol used it to bring us the Bosphorus movements and voices as a data sculpture using machine learning techniques. And I guess it is the same reason that as we legal professionals must interest in AI because AI has the potential to alter the way we practice our professional life. And also, since AI has impacts on societies in general, all the legal fields has been affected by the developments of AI technologies. And what must be taught to law students, as it is well uh, told by the, my course speakers, Data may be the first thing to be taught that it is at the center of this technology. Analyzing information, storing information has always been important for human civilizations, such as Incans, they use these kipus to record their important information and make calculations as well. And since data is at the core of AI technologies, the privacy and the security of data play the leading roles when we are debating on the legal effects of AI technologies. And also what must be underlined that we are not only talking about the feature aspects of AI technologies. The AI algorithms, for example, machine learning algorithms are being affected, uh, is affecting our daily lives even from beginning from today. For example, in the UK during COVID-19 pandemic, the high school students exam grades has been calculated by AI algorithms and the students coming from lower uh, welfare families got lower grades and while they were protesting this they were well aware of the fact that us humans are still on the wheel on to decide how to use and develop these technologies whether to widen the gaps of inequalities or to provide much more sustainable future for the next generations and related to that, as Alexander Duma described in Monte Cristo, when Monte Cristo saw Telegraph Tower, even though he knew the behind technology in Telegraph, he cannot help himself to wonder, is there a fairy in the air? How can a message can be traveled from one place to another? And sometimes we as humans 
still does the same thing. We wonder, is there a fair in it? But there is no fair in AI technologies either. No matter how sophisticated this technology is, we must understood and we must teach to law students that not to um, use humanizing wordings when wording, referring, when referring, referring, to, referring to AI technologies. technologies. And this is and so important because, uh, for example, there is no such thing like trustful AI. Because People's institutions can be trustful and as legal professionals, we must provide them to be trustworthy when deploying these technologies into our lives. And as a social technical concept, as it is being referred so by Kahai Committee of the Council of Europe in its feasibility study, the power struggles, power relations in societies and data as in general as a technical concept play the vital role. Therefore, both competition law and data protection law may have the leading roles when we are discussing about the effects of artificial intelligence technologies, even onto other fields of law. And uh, we need multidisciplinary approach and we need each other's expertise in the fields of other fields of law. And also we need professionals other professionals coming from different disciplines, such as design, engineering, and psychology also. And there has not been a yet maybe a AI law separate, as a separate legal field. However, we might say that it is being formed at least at the European level, but AI has impacts on each field of law today. And uh, Ozean University, yes, uh, offers courses for law students, AI and law, cybersecurity, blockchain and law, and data protection law on selective basis. However, there is a book is on the way coming uh, in the intersection of law, ethics, and law of AI. Thank you very much for listening, and we are looking forward to answering your questions. Let me stop sharing my screen. Perfect. Yes. Thank you very much. That was a great presentation. Thank you. So thanks a lot to all of the three th speakers, Gabriel, Maria Jesus and Basak, for sharing your views about what should legal professionals know about artificial intelligence and how it should be taught. Because let's recognize that it is not an easy task, but it's essential to get our hands on it right away and to do something in that direction because the future is inevitable. So this, with this, um, small introduction, I would like to initiate the debate now. Uh, we have already a few questions popping up on the on the chat. Please feel free to ask the questions on the chat and I will be selecting um, the person to ask so that it's more interactive. I will invite you to put on the camera uh, and ask the question yourself uh, with prior introduction of where you're from, what's your function, and uh, giving your questions to us. Beside the speakers, myself and the person who will be asking the questions, please remember to have your camera on as well as your mic off. So the first question uh, I would like to appoint, I think there is uh, Ivan that was wondering, and Ivan, uh, could you please join us on the screen with your mic and the camera on? If of course that is of your. Um... Yeah. Hello, hi. Hello, Ivan. So why don't you introduce yourself and uh, ask your questions? You can also mention which speaker you would like to answer your question. Yeah, I would like to question. Uh, we can. Uh, uh, Pejo. Uh, it's about, uh, oh, sorry, but there is a problem with the internet connection. Okay. Uh, uh, yes, uh, I'm an Italian lawyer. And actually, there are a lot of skepticism about these new technologies. It's like uh, some resistance about it. Uh, so there is a lot of discussion about uh, Yes, but artificial intelligence will uh, means the end of lawyers, of the legal profession. Uh, automated decision making will 
include the judge, the, the um, electoral work will will be non necessary in the future. So it's uh, I'm really I would like to know I'm interested um, like to more about blockchain and artificial intelligence. So I would like to to uh, to ask the, the the panelists if what is uh, what a, what a lawyer should do uh, uh, nowadays should should be should a lawyer learn to to code to to comp to program uh, to do computer programming and to change totally his mind. Okay, there were some technical difficulties, I believe, so I'm not sure if it was just for me, but we couldn't cle hear very clearly. I will allow myself to rephrase and ask. The a lawyer should talk to the. Okay, which so step should the lawyer take in order to be up to date on this uh, topic? Like uh, okay. taking into account that uh, we have we have uh, time constraints, uh, limited time available. We, I can decide yeah. just to take a master on the field, like a, very, a big challenge. Gabriel, Gabriel is raising his hand, so please, Gabriel, could you answer this question? Yeah, uh, first of all, thank you, Ivan. Very, very good question. I think it's uh, top of mind of many of, uh, of our colleagues in the field. The um, I, I, I mean, not, I, in order to answer your question, I, I, I think I would like to make, a, uh, let's say, a story. And um, I, my, my origins in the, in the law profession were in litigation. So I, I was doing mostly commercial and, uh, and, uh, and civil uh, litigation uh, in those days. And I won't say my, my, my age, but uh, I, when I started, I had to take my notes to the court, pick all the information that was coming out from the court, and then bring it back to the, to the law firm and start creating the response or whatever strategy we need to do, to, to do that on those terms. Fortunately now, exactly. fortunately now what I know from, from my colleagues that are uh, dealing with litigation, that is not needed in nowadays because we have tools that can help attorneys to focus on what brings value to their clients. I don't think that uh, artificial intelligence will basically run out of business the, the legal profession. I think we need to understand exactly which areas uh, are of, uh, let's say, of common need for artificial intelligence to step in and improve? And where are the areas where lawyers can utilize this technology as an expert technology to bring better value to, to, to their customers? So it's, let's say, I, I think if, if you will, if you were on a path on, on the start of your career, where should you focus? Do you need to learn coding? Do you need to learn economics? Do you need I think uh, we are in the crossroads of many, many professions. I'm, I'm personally, I have learned how to code. I, I, because I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a geek and I like those parts, but it's not mandatory to, to, to for everybody to learn how to do that. If that's a field that you want uh, your interest to work on, well, there's tons of opportunities on copyright, on intellectual property. Again, I think it's just becoming a smart where you should use technology and where you need to develop skills. Thanks a lot, Gabriel. Does any other speaker from our panel today would like to add something? Oh, Basiak, yes, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Yvonne and Gabriel. I agree with Gabriel that uh, I don't believe that every uh, lawyer must learn how to code, but maybe it is a additional uh, uh, bracelet in an elbow. There is a word in Turkish, and every knowledge is a precious thing. However, the relationship between client and lawyer uh, is going to have bigger importance, I guess. So, design thinking, the thinking to human. Uh, Putting the human at the center of our practice, maybe 
will be much more appreciated, I guess. Yes, okay, thanks. Uh, Eva. Yeah, go ahead. Yourself. Okay, I'm going to give you like my how I have done it. Okay, it has taken me, I am already in the field since four years, and now I know a little bit. Okay, so <laughs> it's not simple. Uh, first thing I did, it was, it's very simple, is uh, you can get into Google and alerts, this alert system they have, and create the alert artificial intelligence. Uh, so every day I get news on artificial intelligence and I read them. And then uh, you get a good feeling of what is going on. And, you know, um, you get uh, an average of five to six uh, news every day. And you will understand then a lot about artificial intelligence, so in which fields is being applied, for what is being applied, uh, who is writing about it, etc. So that's probably my number one tip. My number that's two tip there. is uh, okay. My number two tip is read my book because the book is is not sorry that I say this again because it's the result of me frustrated looking for books that could uh, let's say give me in 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 a let's say just in one book an idea of what is this and, and what does this affect me and what kind of fields are affected, legal fields, I mean. And I guess that there are maybe now more books. I, I haven't done the research because we did that. It, this was published in 2020 May, so it's quite recently. It took us two years to write it. It was not easy because literature is is, is a scarce yet. Yeah, uh, scarce. Titles in Italian are coming. coming yes, out. it's coming and coming. It's coming and coming. And yeah, yeah. So you have to, let's say, try to read uh, a couple of books that clarify and give you a general uh, framework of 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 the technology, of its impact, and it, of its impact in the different legal fields. Okay. So then, once you have that framework. Um, you probably have to specialize because it is such a broad field. Like Gabriel, I think he specializes in AI and ethics, you know. Uh, other people are specializing, like I think Antonio Robles, a friend of mine, is here, and he's specializing in competition law and AI. And maybe he can tell us some things about it. I have friends who are specializing in IP and intellectual property and AI. A judicial and AI, how the judicial is being impacted by 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 AI, you know. So this is again a lot of verticals, you know. Then coding or not coding. Okay, once you understand, let's say uh, what this AI means for a lawyer, which is already a lot, and I, I tell you, it's probably two to three years to get an, a, a clear idea and to organize your ideas in your head. Then you can jump into coding. Why not? is fun and is necessary to, let's say, understand the technology or at least the basics, because this memo I told you, it will just let you understand, uh, I don't know, what is programming, what is Python, basic things, but which I think are, let's say, essential to be respected by the technology people. Because if you sit down with technology people and you only know about law and you know nothing about how they work, I think that it's very difficult that they can work with us. Therefore, I would say yes, but before we still have to do the homework because lawyers, we are not doing our homework. And there is there are a lot of things going on at the moment that we should all be aware of. And I think that probably there would be much more cases now in the judicial if lawyers would be working in this. And uh, yeah, that's my my those are my, let's say, tips. Thanks, Maria Jesus and Ivan that answer your question. Just from me, I think I could add, because it's also my field of specialization, I would add that first of all, and it's it's not even the fact that I specialize in it, but it's basically listening to Simon Sayek, is start with why. So asking yourself why you want to know about that and what's your goal by interest, getting your interest in that, because given the amount of news that is there available and artificial intelligence being such a hype word, we can get lost very easily. So I think that the answer, uh, at least the part to your answer, is knowing what you want. Because if you want to find your, found your own startup in legal tech, and you will therefore work closely with the 
IT or computer scientists or programmers may be getting the basics of coding is something for you. But if you want to approach the topic from the more scientific and more academic perspective, then I don't believe that there is such a need. So it responds to what you want to do in this field as well. And I think that already there is a lot of resources, as it said, and it's also in my to my mind also about uh, because there were several questions in your in your uh, in your question. So about where to start, it's also about getting in the right circle. So surrounding yourself and I believe strongly in the power of the collective intelligence that surrounding yourself with the right people, attending webinars like this, doing your homework, as Maria Jesus says, but then put it in into life if that's the time limit that if, if that's the time constraint that allows you only for discussing it and not putting it for life that's as your hands on it by practicing it's already a lot so i think that step by step we are all learning how to learn because it's not an easy task so is there anyone else um, thank you that would thank like you. to Great, I hope that answered your question and thanks a lot for, for all the contributions to the speakers. Is there any other questions that we would like to ask to our speakers? There is a follow-up from, from Damien Riel. I hope I'm pronouncing correctly. Uh, that That's correct. Uh, I'm Damien Riel. Uh, a bit of background. I, I am a lawyer in the United States, litigated for 15 years, uh, then went to work for Thomson Reuters, building AI systems for Thomson Reuters Westlaw. Uh, currently work for Fastcase, also building AI systems for them. So this is a very interesting discussion. Thank you. Um, the question slash comment that I have is CGE had a very, very good point that as people talk about AI, they often talk about it as AI is magic, right? Uh, not really thinking about what are the specific types of AI that are really important. Are we talking about machine learning? Are we talking about natural language processing? Are we talking about expert systems? Um, or are we talking about data science, uh, which is I think what people value. talk about, people talk about algorithms, that is not yeah. AI. That is just spreadsheets and people looking yeah. at spreadsheets. Um, so really framing what is the AI you're discussing really informs the discussion on how to fix the problems with the AI. Because if you just talk about AI generally, I, I find that those are not very uh, useful uh, discussions. So I'd be interested in the panel's comments about that. Thanks a lot. I, yeah, I couldn't agree more. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I think that's that's really one of the, let's say, first lessons ones who have to understand also, because as Ivan was saying before, um, a lot of the um, uh, newspapers uh, love threatening us and, and, and love making us scared. And I think that we, the feeling we have to have when we approach this is exactly the contrary. It's like curiosity, interest and optimism because there is a field full of possibilities for us but if we look at the ai with uh, like with a feeling of unafraid because you know these robots are coming and you know they are going to kill me then uh, of course we we don't get into the field and i think that is happening very often and of course it's like you know robots i mean we lawyers and robots what do we have to do to to offer there nothing Except and that's also something we, we should not um, uh, yeah, let's say let's, let's, we should really uh, clear this and, and start researching because there is a lot to be said by legal professionals. A lot. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Maria Jesus. Gabriel, I see you ready to jump in. No, oh, sé, pero yeah. que estaba amb una yes, yes. No em I believe that uh, some participants still have their Dale. mics also for so, the. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, somebody is doing me in, in Spanish. I can do in Spanish. Directly, yeah, we can. So. <laughs> we... <laughs> no, and, and Damien, thanks for the great comment and and, uh, and also Maria for the contribution. Uh, th there is perhaps I, 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 this is a book that already everybody has read. There is a fantastic book uh, written by Tim Wu named The Master Switch. In this book, I, I really enjoy it every time I read it because it explains uh, how technology has advanced uh, uh, not only from the perspective of the innovation, but from the perspective of the regulatory cycles, you know, on how you have an inventor that creates this fantastic invention, then the capitals come in and steal the invention and 
then they uh, uh, they uh, basically t take over the regulator and then the regulator becomes smart and the, the, then the cycle starts again, all over again. Uh, in my view, there are principles, uh, legal principles and also ethical principles that basically cross time, no? even from the, the age of the telegraph up to the to the new current age of the of the AI, we are basically talking about tools, tools that are augmenting our ability to do things. And yes, there are advances and advancements that are very, uh, let's say, uh, controversial in some aspects because they they portray to enhance our human ability and us and for us to become superhuman. That debate is there. I'm not neglecting it. There are actually lots of uh, uh, developments in that area. But in reality, most of the AI that we are discussing and, and that we are implementing in our day-to-day -day lives are basically uh, expert tools. Things, uh, tools that are actually uh, doing things that used to be done by humans, but now they are better and more efficient in doing things. Setting aside those, there are key questions underlying these particular tools. And you mentioned in, in your follow-up comment and question around the black box uh, effect, about those areas that uh, it seems that are far away from lawyers to actually get a hold of it. Yes, I, but it's, they are as difficult for attorneys as for engineers. And that's where the principles are there for us to guide us, no? Uh, that's why it's important for us to have the connections between the technical part and also the, let's say, the social, the, the, the human rights piece, no? And um, I'm, I'm really glad that, that, that you made that, that question and, and, and reflection. And for those who haven't read this book, I really, really recommend it. It's really good. Yeah, it's a great book. And Gabriel, uh, please, could you write the title on the chat so that everybody can uh, find it because it's really worth recommending. Um, I think, uh, Bashak, would you have anything to add on this comment? Yes, go ahead. Yes, thank, yes, thank you, Damien, for putting this forward. I believe that we need curiosity in order to get involved in this technology's illegal effects. But fear kills curiosity, so we cannot be f afraid of it. We must know it we, and we must teach the basics. What are these technologies to students? Thank you very much for emphasizing this. Yes, thanks a lot to all the speakers and again to Damian for asking this question. I think that um, indeed it's uh, what I call a buzzword that it attracts a lot of attention and investments. Uh, we know that, so that's why it is used by the uh, business environment. But I also believe, as I believe my view is shared with uh, in here with the audience and the speakers, that there's been a lot of bad marketing around legal tech tools, and that's why we are so afraid of it. And that's why we confuse the concept of the AI and basically attribute the magic of the AI to systems that are easy as the expert legal systems mentioned by uh, by Gabrielle that actually developed in the 80s but were overtaken by the internet. So I think that the conclusion from this can be that the basic knowledge of the IT is actually a first step and maybe not jumping and trying to connect the dots right away and finding maybe books on sources of what can be done with the AI in the legal field, but starting with what is AI and asking out actually what are different fields? What is NLP? What is deep learning? What is uh, machine learning? Is it a part trying to, I know from my perspective, when I was first starting, uh, I had a big issue with the classification because the engineering and the computer scientists, they don't have it all figured out. So no. I think that being open-minded and realizing that it's everything is in movement and not having our uh, legal reasoning of having the categories and things jumping into categories, it's also something to have on the tip of the, of the, of the head. So thanks again, Damien. I think it's a passionate topic. 
If anybody has, uh, has any other questions, they are welcome to put the camera on and ask the question, please. Myself, I have a lot of questions, so if uh, nobody pops out, I'll I allow myself to uh, to go um, proceed with my with my questions. But first, let's ask the audience. <laughs> when the next meeting, they say that will be a part of our. Uh, it's on the March 10th, I believe, but it will be announced when we finish. So, okay. I see there is nobody else that manifests themselves, so I will allow myself to formulate my questions. Something that came to my mind was actually the distinction between the law of AI and the AI application into law as computational law can be understood. So computational law for these who do not really, um, are not very familiarized with this topic is a a scientific domain that studies what can be done with the technology in law and what are, of course, the legal consequences of such. It's also referred to as legal informatics. So my question is the following. Is it essential to specialize in the law of AI to be proficient in the AI for law? Well, I, I may jump in. Uh, my, um, of course, uh, what you cannot do is uh, use technology that doesn't respect the legal framework. So yes, whenever you use technology, there is a previous uh, knowledge that you should acquire, and there are the limits uh, in technology or the limits or the framework. So consumer law, IP law, competition law, data protection, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Uh, but uh, of course, what we lawyers need to understand in that is that these are different fields. So one field is the law of technology, and the other one is the technology for law. Let's say I, I don't really like this name of computational law. I think it's really not clear. Uh, maybe it's because I'm not an English speaker. But um, I think that all this uh, terminology, there is also a problem. You were mentioning the. Um, the lack of a good, unique, uh, uh, let's say, thesaurus for uh, typologies of uh, AI. And I think that the same comes when you talk about the disciplines. It's really messy. It's like a computer law, computational law, uh, legal tech. What is legal tech? I mean, I have an article on that because it really makes me crazy. How is legal tech, the word legal tech used? It's, it says for everything, even the, the product you use to clean your house, you know? So, um, yeah, that, that's my answer to your question. I don't know what Gabriel and Bazak think about it. Bazak, do you want to jump, jump in or? Yeah, 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 yeah okay. please. <laughs> okay. Uh, I guess in order to analyze the risks and benefits that AI uh, is bringing, we, under we have to understand the logic of it. And therefore, maybe we, we cannot say we must, but we need to learn uh, the basics of it. And so my answer is yes for your question. On my, on my thoughts on, on that reflection, I one of the key, let's say, areas that we as lawyers most master throughout our career is how we articulate arguments and how we articulate concepts. And indeed, there is quite a lot of, uh, let's say, false words around this particular technology. Um, in that sense, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit of a Wittgenstein it. Let's put it that way. I, I, I would like uh, moving forward in our profession to clarify many concepts, concepts that have been even discussed prior to the, the, uh, the um, let's say, to the emergence of this technology in our legal profession, like privacy like data protection, like uh, uh, what it means to have, a, let's say, legal access to evidence abroad uh, for, for digital evidence. There are, unfortunately, there are many uh, concepts that are still too vague that uh, 
I don't think uh, it's, of course, the intent of regulators, of legislators to create ambiguities, but in, the reality is that that is happening. And in many cases, we need courts and we need lawyers to step up and work towards making those concepts to be clarified. And it has to start from the, from the academy, of course, from the universities. So if you are creating programs that are just basically ba adding to the, to the uh, vagueness or the ambiguity of the concepts, well, that's perhaps not the right way to go. We, we need to bring more clarity to the system. Yes, excellent points. Thank you very much for your answers. And I believe I, I do agree with everything that has been said. There is, um, to follow up with you, Gabriel, I think that Montesquieu said that um, you should not add more laws if you don't have things clear because they just create this ambiguity. And unfortunately, I must state that that's the reality of today's regulation of the artificial intelligence. I mean, uh, we have with us in the audience um, Tomasz Zalewski, who's the founder of Polish Legal Tech Community, and he has recently and who's uh, sharing the courses on coding for lawyers or coding. So um, hello and welcome to this webinar, Tomasz. And he has recently shared on LinkedIn the comparison of EU legislating for the AI and digital, uh, all the fields of cybersecurity, data protection and all the related fields, as we discussed today, for the EU and for the US. I remember the numbers because I took this graphic for my class and I shared with the students to just make them realize that as we are in Europe, they are lucky just to be um, obliged to follow 4,250 legislation within the last three years, as opposed to the US, where the number was above 7,500, I believe. So um, I think these numbers demonstrate not only the ambiguity around the topic, because I strongly believe personally that less is more and the biggest experts, they can speak with few words and be clear on the topic. And also the importance of this matter for the, uh, for the society, because the need to regulate these new technologies uh, is so um, is so urgent. So uh, I don't know if anyone else has any thoughts about that, what I just said. There is some questions, I'm checking the chat, but of course, if any of the participants is curious about something or would like to address a question, they are welcome to, uh, to join the discussion. On your last comment, I think we urgently need to create ministries all across the countries that are named deregulation ministries that are focused entirely to eliminate re redundant or ambiguous regulation. It's, um, I, I cannot agree more with the, with the comment that we just have too much, too many regulation in the EU. And it's not only that, it's all the, the regulation that is coming over. We, we also need to, to reckon and, and also understand why this is happening. And one of the major fears in the, in the uh, particularly in the, in the region, is the fear of being left behind of all the uh, development, the economic development that is happening around this technology. The, uh, let's assume that uh, there, there is one quote from, uh, from Satya Nadella, the, um, the, the CEO for, for Microsoft. He mentioned that the, um, in, in uh, last summer, he, he mentioned that the wave of digitalization in the globe that we were expecting as Microsoft for the next five to 10 years has happened in just six months. We, even before the pandemic and all the, the digitalization across the, the, the globe that happened in a very uh, fast pace, we were already looking at the risks and at the harms that, that, the, that the 
that this evolution or this development were, were doing into the, the several economies. And, and, and the question is, are we addressing it properly? Are we implementing smart regulation to actually, uh, well, have an opportunity to compete in, in same terms? And for those who are who 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 are more familiar to European Union legislation, there's a very vivid uh, debate around data sovereignty or a, a digital sovereignty and whatever that means, because unfortunately it means something different per member state. I think it's it's needed that debate. We it is. Uh, it, this pandemic has demonstrated that uh, there are things that are just too important for a country to have it provided from abroad. When you cannot really uh, attest about the solidarity of all countries, and we are seeing right right now with the with the vaccines and so on, I think it's a, a major a major uh, a reflection that we need to do as individuals, as uh, citizens of our countries, that there are things that we, we definitely need to, to work in our countries. And we, we need to provide similar opportunities to everybody. Uh, and the question is, who will take the first step? And I think we need to take that step together. Because if we, if we take that, those steps separately and not jointly, then we create all this mess, all this regulatory mess that only, in my opinion, will just create more divide, more inequalities. Yes, thanks a lot for that comment, Gabriel. Basak? Uh, thank you, Gabriel, uh, Iga and uh, Maria. Uh, I will add something else. Uh, I guess technology and law has some uh, common point that ordinary people, everyday people need to understand both of them, both law text and technology, for example, security alerts or consent information. But they are both designed not for everyday people. Maybe the design of uh, legal text and technological te text also are important to uh, us to work more on it. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, good, good, good point, Bashak. That's true that sometimes we forget uh, forget about that, getting the bigger picture. Uh, there is one more question that appeared on the chat, and I believe that um, it, it will lead to an interesting debate as well. Uh, Karin, would you like to um, put the camera on and ask your question? Karin, um, um, I think I'm pronouncing the name right, Karen. Um, if I will just read the question then, uh, but you are welcome to join us in the discussion. That's your it's your question. In your opinion, what is the most important challenge for artificial intelligence? So, shall I try to answer? Sure. Just okay. Answer. OK, well, the challenges are, are several. I think Gabriel pointed out one of the most important ones, which is the, um, the, uh, the uh, gap that, ca that artificial intelligence can create. So um, this is a technology that is being built by uh, or developed by a few companies, used by a few companies. And uh, it will probably enlarge the gap between the uh, big companies and the small ones. So I think that that's a big thing. And it's not only from the business point of view, but also from the citizens point of view. Uh, some people will understand AI and what it is about, and then some others will not. Uh, but their rights will be affected as well. So I think these breaches in, in are, are, are super important and a big challenge. A uh, second challenge is that AI is being built normally by multinational um, uh, teams and in different countries. And, and I think that that's also a challenge because uh, we unfortunately still don't have a universal law. 
uh, universal declaration of digital rights. And I think that this kind of global uh, approaches to technology development and, and implementation demands another approach to uh, to uh, another uh, challenge comes from the control of what is being done and what is going to be done with what is being done in AI. And we have already have examples like Google employees rebel in 2018 uh, with their uh, company and they said we are not going to work in this project. Uh, we don't know what was exactly the project, but apparently Google's company had decided to work for the Defense Department in the US to build something. Uh, probably it had to do with um, uh, war and killing or not killing, but defense, and they didn't want to do it. So they had to, uh, they, they, their union represented them and they decided not to do it. But uh, that's also a challenge. In fact, I think that uh, uh, my feeling, and I want your point of view on this, is that at the moment, uh, let's say that the only control that some companies have is the control done by their employees. So the ethics of the employee and the courage of the employees to, let's say, at a certain moment, rebel, rebel against uh, this kind of developments is the only thing that might stop uh, certain things. Uh, of course, uh, China is investing tons of money in technology and we know very little. I mean, China is not known for transparency and that's also something that worries me uh, because the few things that we have seen on what is being done in China is incredible. I mean, it's, it's total control of uh, uh, every uh, single thing that citizens do. So this, these are, let's say, in my opinion, some of the challenges that AI brings us. Um, a society and economy. Thanks, Justa. And uh, yeah, sure, go ahead, Basak. I agree with you, Maria. And I can add one more uh, thing. Maybe we can uh, work more on the international responsibility, the legal liability of international corporations before we talking about the legal personhood of robots. We must tackle with the problem of international corporations which have political powers maybe today with lobbying and etc. These are much more important to tackle the problems coming by the AI technologies. Mm -hmm. So you both touched upon something that is uh, closely related to the corporate social and technological responsibility of the companies. So it's a term that um, appears a lot also in the discussion around the what can be done and uh, transparency was even in the title of one of the European Union uh, reports, one of a lot. Uh, so indeed, it's a it's a main point point and main challenge for everyone around us. I think that I would I I would add from myself that I I, will, I fear what I don't know. So I think that everything we know and the challenges that we identified, we can kind of handle them because we are aware of them. So I was told when I was a student that a good lawyer thinks about what is not said. So in the same logic, I think that we can fear what is not being said and what is not being um, the object of the discussions. So what is not yet identified that can be done in this broad and developing area. I think that we have um, maybe, I, I don't know, Gabriel, would you like to add anything on this uh, question of the challenge? Yes, well, just to be provocative because um, we are agreeing just too much. And, uh, we are looking provocative, there, go ahead. There are, there are I, I have a couple of comments on, on, on what, my, uh, what Maria and Basak uh, mentioned. First, I don't I don't think that uh, it's all blue skies for the companies or for the corporations in the sense that uh, only the employees are actually enforcing through their ethical values whatever the, the companies are developing. Uh, there is, a, there is, let's say, there, there is a substantial element of it and, and I agree that it is present in many companies. I can I can spend uh, some time explaining what we do at Microsoft, but uh, what I want to convey and also going to Vashak's uh, comment around 
controlling international corporations on a more broader space. I think I think we need governments as well to step up. Uh, in the sense that uh, most of the um, the key deviations that we are looking at the uh, in the use of this technology, unfortunately, are coming from governments. I can I can give you three examples, three cl clear examples. There is one case that I mentioned in, during my presentation. It was the use of facial technology, uh, 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 facial recognition technology by the uh, by the um, police department of South Wales. There is also a clear example in the Netherlands by the use of artificial technology in the assignment of social services uh, uh, through an algorithm named uh, Siri. Uh, there is also one example in, um, th there are a couple of very, uh, 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 let's say, unique examples in the U.S. by having access to, to, to legal uh, uh, representation. But one that is very recent, at least for me, and, and had kept me part of my winter time uh, awake, was the solar wind uh, uh, cyber attack. Uh, that was originated in, in one specific country. Uh, that has promoted cyber attacks uh, uh, to civilian institutions all across the board and also to uh, public systems. And we, we need regulators to step up. We need regulators to come into international agreements and to also regulate their own power on how they are utilizing this technology. Let's not forget that the most of the developments or the, let's say, the, the, the regulation that has uh, been present on privacy or, or, or right uh, to, for secret communications had a result of abuse of power. Had a result from the, 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 the abuse of power from the Stasi or, or from the abuse of power in the, um, during uh, the, the colonial times in, in the U.S. So, it, of course, it is important as well to, to look upon the equal distribution of wealth. And that's a different conversation that I think it's, it's due and we need to have it. But on how we are utilizing this technology, we need governments to step up. Yes, interesting point and uh, obviously different perspective. Uh, and that's what makes the webinar also interesting that Gabriel is representing a different uh, sides of the coin as working in Microsoft, uh, Bashak working at the university and Chusa advising the companies and bringing the universities together. So I think that one of the uh, key points also to take from this discussion is that we need to all work together on this and it's not just the responsibility of international companies the governance, the government has to take a step up. Uh, super, uh, I mean, not on the national level, I believe on the supranational level, as it is emphasized on numerous occasions. So I think a lot could be said about the regularization of the AI and even in the comments, as we had a small parallel discussion, I couldn't stop myself to bring a very important point of that we don't know. <laughs> I mean, we don't know what we want. Again, coming back to my to my um, philosophical Simon Sayek reference, because lately I've been discussing that with some of computer scientists and um, legal professionals, and they said as for the explainability of the artificial intelligence, which might be one of the maybe one of the legal requirements of the GDPR is that firstly, we need to define what explainability is, because in order for the computer scientists to provide products that are explainable, they need to know what they want to produce. So there is this dialogue, miscommunication about the expectations between, because if you don't know what you want, you're gonna get what you get. And I think there is a lot to be said around that. I see Gabriel smiling and probably he has some contra argument, but unfortunately the time does not allow us to go into that discussion. Uh, for the, if there are no more questions that are surging from the, from the chat, I will allow myself to get back to my presentation 
uh, thanking all the speakers and all the participants and presenting you what is else to come at this um, webinars of Innovation in Law Studies Alliance. So in our next meetings that are coming in the upcoming May. There's a hand raised. Uh, yeah. There is, sorry. One hand, one raised hand. OK, sure. If there is, we, I think we can squeeze one more question. So if somebody has a question, um, they can manifest it and uh, ask that out loud, Iga, please. Iga, we, we had a question before that we didn't answer, which is the added value of AI for clients. Uh, we didn't answer to that one. And now there is somebody saying whether we it would be a useful tool to control AI uh, using the whistleblower blower system that they have okay. in the US. But okay. I already said to the second person, no, that we are not answering because of lack of time. So you decide what we okay. do. It's now yes. 16, so my, suggestion, my suggestion is the following. Let me just do two more slides of this presentation. So we end formally the meeting. And of course, all of them, all of those who can stay and discuss the two questions that popped out are welcome to stay. We have just a few more minutes, so let's finish with presenting the webinars to come, and then I will address the questions that popped out. Thanks for pointing that out. So the next webinar is about the legal hackathon and how to successfully, successfully organize one. So it is, of course, um, targeted to the universities as such initiatives have arisen. The, the next one will be about what is a legal tech lab, when and how to set up one. And the last, uh, the one out of three, is about the question that already appeared today on the chat and was partly discussed, but of course, a lot more can be said on the topic and especially a lot more can be asked about the topic is, should the lawyers know how to program or not? If so, what and how can we better can we do to better teach them to do it? So shall you have any questions regarding the Innovation in Law Studies Alliance, do not hesitate to write to this email or write the message on WhatsApp uh, to that number that will be uh, provided to you also in the recording of the, this webinar because this webinar has been recorded. So thanks to those who are watching us again. And I believe that now that my presentation is over, we can get back to the questions and those who um, have the intention of staying with us for a few more minutes are more than welcome to do so. Uh, so the question that wasn't addressed was the one, please help me out in here. So you're asking me? Um, okay, yeah. Okay, the question we had is, um, so, what card can AI um, do for for clients of law firms? So added value, added value of AI yes. for clients. And I think it was uh, okay. Yeah, go ahead, please. The, the person who asked that question, um, yeah, I see Tomas, there. Tomas Amborski, who was raising his hand, but I'm not sure if it was him. No, it was it was Ivan who raised Hi, this one. Hey, Ivan. Me, a story. Yeah, what kind of uh, uh, how can I bring this technology uh, to my in my in my profession? I, for example, uh, you work for maybe a small company, and uh, how can you? What is the added value you can bring to this to, to the work? I mean. Uh, it change the way we make contracts, we make international contracts, we make international commerce, the way restructuring a company. It, uh, um, and uh, it's difficult to to address these topics to especially to small companies who are, do that do us not who are not really uh, they are doing the same way as 10 years ago and are, are not really into invest so much in such a 
technology, new technologies and all. So it's uh, it's that's the question. Okay, I don't know if. Okay, I, thank you, Ivan. Uh, so I think that we can uh, generally put it as the. Yeah. In general, like there is so many fields that that are that will change soon with these new technologies. But, but contract review, I think that we can use it as an example of practical case one. study for the application of the artificial intelligence. And more precisely, uh, smile to Damien, the natural language processing into the contract analyst. So any um, expert from the panel would like to intervene? What can uh, be okay. done? I can, yeah, I can, I can share with you my my ideas. So, well, um, this is not like okay. What are the um, possibilities? No, yeah. the first thing to do is what are the problems in your law firm? So, never look at the technology to then go to your law firm. First, look into your law firm and identify what. Um, a strategic people call pain points. So those things that really are, are hurting your organization. Sometimes is the way you manage people. Sometimes is the way you manage documents. Sometimes is the way you manage clients. Sometimes is the way you manage knowledge. I don't know or finance. So that yeah, that to give you some examples. Once you identify the things you are not doing well, then you can go into the market and see which are the solutions. Uh, sometimes it will be something with artificial intelligence. Most of the times what most law firms need is just an ERP. This means a software to, let's say, just organize the basics on the law firm. So invoicing, document, client uh, management, contacts, etc. Then secondly, it might be something to uh, to do like contract automation, like you, uh, you you automatize your documents, you convert it into templates, and therefore you can handle them in a most uh, efficient way. Uh, of course, nowadays with the pandemic, video conference systems and a digital signature, and uh, I'm probably forgetting something relevant, but I would say that these are like the, the basics. Yeah, but let's not uh, look at technology as a goal or as a uh, yeah, but let's let's see the other way around as a tool to solve our problems. So that's the way to do the approach, in my opinion, Ivan. I hope it helps. Thank you. Yes. But by the way, in Italy, there are some interesting tools. I tell you, there is a guy, uh, pa Paolo something. I can look for the name. He has a tool and it's a uh, cloud and it's cheap and you can uh, put your contracts in there and then the, it will um, uh, structure your contracts and you can identify or find anything in there. It's a fantastic tool and it's Italian. So um, yeah. if uh, now I, I don't remember the, na the, the name, but I can look for it in something like handy contracts or something like that. Yeah, really nice to by email or? Yes, yes, I can uh, just put your data here or something or just write us and I, I'll send it to you. I, OK, thank, thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Th thank you. Thank you, uh, Ivan, for asking and Maria Jesus for uh, responding. Uh, um, there is another question that appeared and of course uh, we cannot force our speakers if they have any other engagements. They are also uh, free to, to leave the conversation, so don't feel obliged whatsoever to stay with us. But of course, you are more than welcome uh, to stay. There is one more question about autonomy. So um, uh, would you like to introduce yourself and ask the question? Uh, Tomas, I think it was. I'm searching your your comments. Yeah, Tomas Am Amborski. Tomash, we cannot see you. His, his silence, maybe. May, uh, the mic microphone maybe is not active. There is. We, we, we don't see you, Thomas. We see something transparent there. But it, it if we hear hard. you, that would be fine. No, no worries. I will just ask the question myself. 
Polish, Polish representation is guaranteed. So Tomasz asks, what about autonomy? So I believe that he refers to self-learning feature of artificial intelligence. And if I may allow myself to complete the question, how does it impact the use of artificial intelligence in law? That's a great question. Hmm. <laughs> Gabriel, the floor is yours. No worries I, so much about I, the connection. I, yeah, I, I have just um, five more minutes, so uh, sorry for jumping in right now. The um, and I'm, 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 I think I will be able to answer Tomas' uh, question together with your com your final comment, yeah, and uh, about not knowing what you don't know and and utilizing tools to 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 understand that, no, the. Uh, and I think it's it's worth to comment on how artificial intelligence work right now, no? And um, it's very similar. It's very similar to uh, linear uh, programming. And let me explain a couple of very very small concepts. The way artificial intelligence is being built utilizes Bayesian networks. For those who are economists will know that uh, the Bayesian, Bayesian uh, networks are created by basically uh, uh, assumptions of if this happens, this could, th this can be the result or this one. And it's a switch on and off uh, type of, of response. The way it's built, this type of, of networks is you have several layers and the black box event happens when you exceed the, uh, let's say the amount of layers that can be explained through these Bayesian networks. And that's, let's say, that's all, and forgive me for utilizing this word, but it's, that's all science. And that's how most of the AI systems are being built right now. Uh, why I'm mentioning uh, that this is all science, it's not me saying this first. <laughs> it's, uh, let's say the most, uh, some of the most recognizable uh, engineers in that field. The, the problem with this particular uh, way of we are developing this technology is that it utilizes, a, 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 let's say, a inferences, or and it gives you probabilities. No, it, it gives you this is this is what is going to probably happen. No, this that's the result that you that you receive from those tools. And the question is, okay, what hap what then? What should be the response when it doesn't happen? Well, that's a complete different model, and those are casual models. And those are, let's say, those are the the real forefront of this science. And that's why we need to develop, for example, quantum computing, because the amount of data and the amount of computing power that you need to create causal models, it's it's currently unattainable. When we are able to, let's say, to understand, or to develop those uh, type of, uh, let's say, developments on AI, well, we may have a different seminar altogether. But understanding where are the key deficiencies of the current models allow you to explain where you can utilize these two. And going back and you know narrowing down to the question of uh, uh, from from Tomas, the um, autonomy exists, yes, but again there are some decisions that machines can take, but they, that they are so just too important for them to take them by themselves. For example, if I just d decides, okay, I'm gonna take the decision automatically and. Poof, uh, uh, presses a button and then the decision is this guy goes to jail and the judge hey the machine already uh, decided for me i don't need to, to 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 look at this well perhaps we don't want those type of judges what we need is hey what is the probability that this person will commit again a crime the tool tells you this is the probability i understand that this is built on Bayesian networks that not necessarily contain all the data that I need. Great. But this is just a tool. The decision is mine. And that's where the autonomy 
fails, well, well, should stop, in my opinion, for those important decisions that impact human rights or fundamental rights. Thanks a lot, uh, Gabriel. Uh, Bashak, would you have anything to add on the topic? Yes, and uh, this is the reason why Kahai Committee of the Council of Europe insists on human oversight, especially the things when it affects the human rights. And we can challenge the decisions of the humans, but not the, the algorithms, therefore, because there is no casualty. Uh, we, just the correlations and the, this will challenge the matter of proof our demands. Yes, yes, certainly very precise and uh, appreciated comment. I think that from my side I can also add, and it goes back to the previous discussion that we had about things that can be done in terms of efficiency, maybe better than humans, but also things that we want to get done and that may not align with what can get done. So I believe that it is a special um, reflection, maybe a bit, again, philosophical in terms of what do we have the legal system for? Maybe it's not just to be the most efficient, maybe it's to be human, to um, prosper and to boost the progress, to share the understanding and the human values. So uh, there is a lot of things that can be discussed aside about the predictive justice, as it's something we haven't even just with the last comment of uh, Gabriel about the judges, but it's a whole another discussion that we can open and the webinar could also last for a few more hours. So I believe that with this question uh, we can end our session of today. Thank you very much for all the speakers again for their contribution, their presence, their time to be here with us with ILSA and thanks a lot to all the participants who participated so actively and exchanged on this passionate topic with us. Do not hesitate to get in touch with us, either with me on Maria Jesus or other country representatives. There are 14 of us and we are present all over the world today. So thanks again to everyone and let's keep in touch and see you on the next ILSA webinar.